All right, now we're on chapter three, inductions tool. Uh, let's just start by talking about uh, that induction tools provide measures of formation resistivity at multiple distances from the borehole. It has a different depth of investigations. Although the tool responds to formation conductivity in units of millimo per meters, yeah, that's how it's read, Results are presented in units of resistivity, ohms per meter, by industry standard. And as we know, resistivity and conductivity are inversion, inversional proportionally. Uh, well, this is the borehole where the tool is going to be exposed. The applications is why running an induction tool is to get this value the true resistivity of the uninvaded zone. Actually, for resistivity logs, this is what you want to calculate or to obtain. And dependent on the environment, you should run whether an induction tool or a lateral log. We will talk about lateral log in later chapters. But an important a uh, comment on this is that to get water saturation, you need to calculate a uh, true resistivity of the uninvaded sand, and you will assume some other factors, like tortuosity factors and saturation exponents. Uh, finally, what we're interested in is in knowing hydrocarbon saturation, and this is the formula. You just basically subtract one to water saturation, and whatever is not water is assumed to be hydrocarbons. Well, let's talk about the logging conditions. You can log it in area drill, boreholes, all the base mud, and fresh water base mud. To decide whether to run a ladder log or an induction tool, you get the ratio of the resistivity of the mud filtrate and the resistivity of the formation water. If it's less than 2.5, then a lateral log must be run. If it's greater, then an induction tool is preferred. The physics of measurement, theoretically, it's based on Ampere's law and Faraday's law. And this is how it works. You apply AC current to a coil which is going to create a magnetic field, and this is going to create a ground loop in the formation. Then, uh, at your receiver, which is another coil, that ground loop is going to induce a voltage in the receiver, and you will be measuring a voltage. This is according to the Ampere's law. So you combine both Ampere's and Faraday. In this simple example, uh, there's one transmitter and one receiver. And this is what happens here. You apply your current, this is the primary magnetic field, creates the primary ground loop, which is going to, through a secondary magnetic field, is going to induce a voltage. And that is an ideal scenario, because in reality, there are a bunch of other things happening there. In this graph, you can see the in very low resistivities, uh, a secondary ground loop is created. And that is not good. You don't want that. Because th this happens in low resistivity formations. And it's going to create, it's going to provide your receiver information that is not related to the true properties of the formation. So you just want to find a way to measure that and to, uh, to correct your values. So in short, you got R signals, which are, which are the good ones, the ones that truly represents your formation. You got mutual signals, which is, uh, let's call it noise or signals that are caused by the interference of your transmitter into your receiver. And the X signals, which are generated in the low resistivity formations. 
on this area we're talking how to address mutual signals that is basically using several coils but even after using several coils there is still some error it's called sound error and uh, we take care of that in the calibration or at least should take care of that in the calibration with a valid calibration the AX signal as we said before happens in very low resistivity formations do you have an idea of how much is that is less than three ohms per meter so when that happens there's going to be this skin effect which is undesired again a summary of your signals and Remember that your induction tools will provide you with several depth of investigations. I may measure from the flush sound, the transition sound, and the uninvaded area. Here, there's a summary about the effects of formation water resistivity, porosity. All those elements are joined in the Archie's equation. Or tortuosity. Um, yeah, let's talk about tortuosity. This is a technical concept, but basically what you see on this graph is the path that must follow current through the formation. So in this one it has to move like this, this one has it has the current has to move like this and uh, here's the concept tortuosity is a is a ratio of the length of current flow through water field per space to the linear length of the rock it's better expressed like this you if you compare like the path the current could flow if it were like free space just like a straight line and what happens in reality like current has to go through all the pore space and that is through tracity and that's came through fluid separation effects of porosity if you graph them on this and uh, putting all together yeah we want to arrive to this point well basically your the readings of your residue tools are going to be influenced by tracity cementation exponents water separation and all that here is the archie water separation model and its limitations let's get my way okay uh this boss this is interesting these are a and m values depending on which type of lithology you encounter and combined with porosity in the case of sandstone you can assume these values and this is just like a really long manual uh, no, this his name goes Archie in this area of the manual this should be rough this one yeah this is basically how our friend Goose Archie came up with his equation. It was back in 1942. What he did, he took uh, 72 samples, and he plotted, and he found out that model. We can go to the details of that. That what that was what he did. Again, our values for the model and let's just make it short uh, that was like a real uh, a brief summary of this just a skimming so thanks for watching